super stoked. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. mm-hmm. Get right into it. Phil's going to be do- doing a lot of mm-hmm. How's the mm-hmm. Throw? Mm-hmm. All right. So, I guess I yeah, have brother. What? How stoked talk? are you? You can talk? I mean, I can hold down a few words for sure. Yeah. Well, fuck, man. We're back on the Castle Blum platform. We're giving flowers. You know what tonight is? Tonight is show number 20. We've been 20 of these bitches. We stoked or what? Yes, we are. More than ever, man. We got a foundational pillar in the game jumping on with us. What's already Johnny in a car in traffic in Las Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, man. So normally Johnny Phil has the dopest intros, but since he like he like writes them all out, like the whole thing, he sounds like some rapper from Wu Tang and <laughs> whatever. So I'm gonna give you the best intro I can. It's nothing compared to Phil's, but today we're giving forward. To the one, the only Johnny De Cesare. Johnny is a legend. He is foundation of our whole sport in 2015 through the format of fit to showcase our sport. And we get to sit down here with him today and tell you all about your awesomeness, Johnny. So thank you so much for taking time because I know you're never home. Uh, yeah, I'm stoked. Stoked to be on the show with you, boys. So. So, you know, and everyone that's watching, like, do, have you ever seen this show? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that, so you know, but the people that are just tuning in, the point of the show is called Giving Flowers. Bill and I created this show because uh, we love this sport more than anything. Like, whenever we talk, we always talk about different things and then what's going on, what happened, where we come from, all this shit, where it's going. And we're sitting there, and, and a lot of time we think about, like, you know, people, like, that did this or that in the sport and get no love. And so we're just like, you know, Phil's got an awesome platform because he's relevant, you know, and like he's a good friend. And then I have a lot of stories of people I've known. So we're like, man, let's make a show giving flowers, celebrate all the people and give thanks and maybe educate like some people on who you guys are. So the point of the show, man, is to give thanks for everything that you did for the sport of Twin Tip Skiing and just to celebrate you for an hour or two, man. So thank you for uh, being here. Thank you. Thanks, boys. Thanks for thinking of me. Stoked. Super stoked. Where are you right now? Well, I was supposed to be at home, chilling on the couch with you boys, but I had to drop my daughter off and we had to go across LA. And on the way back, it said two hours and 40 minutes. We were like, uh, what? (laughs) Is she traveling again? Not, uh, well, yeah, she's going to Idaho. She's going to go skiing. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, so she surfs, but she likes skiing, too, and she's going to go visit her grandma for Thanksgiving, go for a little ski ride, you know, do a little skiing. Well, that's wicked, man. She probably spent way too much time at home in the last Um, So my question to you is, so Phil always likes, we like to do a little background before yep. we get into anything. So pretty much to intro you, you know, you were one of the first guys to create any movie on twin tip skiing and all the awesome tricks in the late 90s, but... What's your kind of background? I guess, like, if you were to, what got you stoked on making ski film? Where did you come from? And how did it even come about in, like, a, I don't know, in your version? Oh, man, I don't know. That's a crazy question. Uh, I guess I've answered this a couple times. You have. So you can make it short, because that, that's not about the part of saying how dope yeah. you are. Yeah, yeah, all good. <laughs> Phil, you're so funny. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, the thing is, I watched... Uh, I watched uh, the Hanukkah on TV when I was a kid. I was living closer to the beach than the mountains. I was already a surfer, and I I was blown away by it. And I, I went to my mom, and I was like, Mom, I'm going to become a skier. She's How old like, are you? Like 10. So you're a 10-year-old in where? Riverside, California, the valley? No, no. I was in... Uh, in Northridge at the time, so deep, oh. like straight up valley girl, like valley guy type thing. Like, why do I think Riverside? Did you live uh, there? My, well, my mom used to live there back in the day. But, okay. Yeah. Oh, surfing. Right. So <laughs> Phil pulls up visuals while you talk. So I just want to make people know, like Johnny comes from Southern California, 
and like it's crazy it's, you have ski dreams as a 10 year old so, yeah so i'm a surfer with ski dreams right and uh and i just make my mom take me to the mountains and i'm like i'm i'm gonna be a skier and before i went to the mountains i had an idea to buy my own pair of skis before i even knew how to ski so she would give me a dollar every day for lunch right because it only cost a dollar back then for lunch so she gave me a dollar for lunch money and i saved every single dollar and skipped lunch just ate my friend's leftovers for like but this is all year. just from watching an alpine ski race on national television all from kid. watching abc wide world of sports Sick. no joke and uh, so i saved my money and i still remember the pair i got a pair of nice old skis they were like red they looked like red white and blue almost i don't know they were they were red they were sick they were just my size bought them off a friend used and then uh my mom took me to the mountains for the first time and she said okay before you go in the chairlift you got to take a lesson and i said well can i practice she goes but you can't go on the chairlift so i hiked the mountain i went up the first hill and i i skied down i had already looked on on at the, the school library, how to ski, how to make a, you know, like the pizza, the wedge. So wait, 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 if you're 10 years old, Southern California, but Big Bear, or what's your spot? Yeah, we went to Big Bear. It was Snow Valley, California. Okay. And uh, so I researched how to stop, how to turn. When we got there, she said I couldn't go on the lift, so I hiked. I promptly turned, put my skis on, started jamming down the mountain. And I was like, I'm skiing. And then... I promptly ran into the picnic benches at the bottom. I couldn't stop exactly. And I was like, yes, I did it. You're a youth that loves skis, so I'm going to be pretty good at speeding this up. You're a youth that loves skiing. Now you're in Southern California. Let's just go through all the young years quick. Like, do you get into movies right away? Or what's the year? How old are you? Okay, let's say I'm at 14 now. And my mom got me a camera, a VHS recorder for, I think it was my birthday. I can't remember exactly, but I got this camera and I fell in love with shooting everything. So I just started shooting and we'd shoot surfing. We didn't ski it. We didn't take it to the mountains really. I mean, we skied, but we didn't, I didn't think about shooting skiing, but then, uh, so went from there and then I, I, I really fell in love with skiing. I thought I was pretty good at it. And I was like, I'm going to be the best guy on the hill, Big Bear. And then by 17, I think, I was like, oh, I'm pretty good, at least in my own mind, right? Because I hadn't been to a real mountain yet. What was your and, favorite uh, thing about skiing at Big Bear? Like, were, was there moguls at the time? Good job. Moguls? Like, what? There was this thing called the wall at Snow Summit, and it was just a big mogul field. It was probably their steepest run. And I was like, I'm going to master this thing. Because I saw this guy ripping it once, like... Just ripping down the moguls. I was like, I want to be at least as good as that guy in one year. And I, my goals were always set to be at least that good. That was it. Then, Wicked. Then speed so up. it was moguls that kind of like gave you your drive as a, like at your hill? Jump. I wanted to go in the air. So the only way to jump is like moguls. John, or your traffic could break this up. What? You're kind of bad. Oh, you're just breaking up now. You know? Oh, no. You got me now? Yeah. You got me? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to jump. So moguls were my were my thing. That's the only way I could do it. So yeah. I went to moguls. Hey, you're a SoCal guy. You're in the moguls. How did, and now it's what? Is it late 80s or early 90s? It's late 80s. No, it's now it's early 90s. In in 91, I got this uh, I got this job at IBM. I know, crazy. So I went from super into skiing, and I was still super into skiing. But I got headhunted. I started working for IBM, which is crazy. And then uh, and then I quit because I couldn't take it anymore. I was wearing a suit and tie, and I was like, I'm out of here. My mom cried, and I said, Mom, I'm moving to Vail, Colorado. I'm gonna be a skier. So you're now what? Did you go to school? Did you go to college? Yeah, I was going to college, and I got headhunted by IBM, and they, they told me to take a break and come to their company, and I started making money. 
I was like, oh, good. That's pretty fucking weird. So you had a real job. You're like 22. You hated the real job. You move out to Colorado. You become like a mobile skier guy. And you love camera work. So this is like, to me, this is where you come into the film picture because it's like, I don't know what ended your, maybe, what ended your drive to be a skier and be more of a cameraman? Uh, well, I skied on the Pro Tour for like seven, eight years. I, I kind of made it to the mobile Pro Tour because you didn't, you didn't have to qualify for anything. It was just like, you pay your money, you can be one. And I had a friend named What Turbo. years did you do the Pro Tour from? Okay, so in Vail, I started skiing. I was serving, like... I was just a regular guy serving soup and then making hot dogs. And then I finally got my ski instructor, like, permit, you know, like, your license. And I started ski instructor for Vail. And then I had this friend. His name was Turbo. That was his name, Turbo. And he was like, dude, you should do the, the tour with me. And I was like, Turbo? He wants me to do the tour? You think I'm good enough? He's like, you're good enough. Let's go. So I went on the pro tour. I started doing moguls, competing. Made one podium. <laughs> Fucking bad. So what years did you do the pro, pro tour from? Until? Uh, like, until like 96, I'd say. But in 90... Okay, so like in their first movie of Fade, Fade Black, 95, 96, was that your last year competing? Uh, yeah. And I was basically filming while I was. Nice. I got my dates down though, so you better be Dude, able to. You're, you're really good. I'm not gonna lie. You're good with the dates. You're better than me, I think. But I was filming while I was um while I was on the tour a little bit. But those guys were so good. I was just like, oh my god. I I, I told my friend I was gonna make a movie once because the way that we started making movies because uh, Warren Miller invited us to ski for his film, like a bunch of the pro mogul skiers. And I remember filming all day, and I was busting my butt. And, you know, his movie's like an hour and 45 minutes, almost two hours long back then. And our part finally came on, and they showed, like, three minutes of the mogul skiing. And I didn't even have a shot. I was like, what just happened? And I was like, screw that. Well, let me ask you this. Phil, Phil just told me this story this morning. I never heard it before. It's fucking awesome. He watches all your interviews to get the research. That's why it's such a bummer. He can't talk. He is on point. But I never heard this story before. But what movie, what movie was that? I don't remember the exact movie. But I was bummer. mad enough where I was like, forget it. I'll make my own movie. And I told my buddy, I'm like, hey, you're moving to Vail next year with me. And we're going to make a movie. And that was... Uh, and that was the year that you made Fade to Black? Yep. 94. Okay. Wicked. Okay, so you're making a movie. You're all fucking stoked on moguls. You're in Colorado. You're known yep. as the guy who created this tip shit. So, like, to me, I look at it, I'm like, all right, dude, you're on a pro tour. Like, I remember, like, in Sprint Bumps and Jumps was huge in the mid-90s. So I was like, man, you must have mixed, but, like... What made you first catch the attention more than a pinned out 360 or a 180 spread 180 to think that it was something different or special? You know what? I was pretty cocky. I was like, we made Fade to Black. And I was like, I'm a filmmaker. Like, I was, I was pretty, I was riding my high horse, you know? I was like, oh, this is cool. We're going to take it to Las Vegas. We're going to get a bunch of sponsors at the ISA show. And it's, you know, mogul skiing is going to blow up. And while we were there, Scott Koff, who was an instructor and a pro mogul skier, he let me put our video in the booth uh, at his uh, at the mogul booth. You know, they had like an association. And um, this kid with super puffy hair, red puffy hair, you could never miss him, came up and was like, dude, I like your movie. I was like, thanks, man. And he's like, hey, we're kind of doing the same stuff you're doing you should really check it out. It's kind of like this new style skiing. I was like, oh yeah, that's cool, man. Uh, when my movie finishes, I'll pop yours in. So he left the tape. And then I didn't put it in right then, which I probably should have looking back on it. But I I waited till our thing finished. And I was like, oh yeah, I should put this kid's thing in there. And I put it in and it was that guy. It was Shane Zox. Oh man, you're on point, Phil. And it was Shane Zox. And uh, I watched him do that. 
And I was like, what the heck? I was like, who is this kid? And uh, that's the shot that you're talking about. Dude, it's crazy. You guys are good. And I, I ended up going all over ISA. And um, the whole, you know, that's like thousands of people. There's 50,000 people in there. And I walked around forever until I found that kid. And uh, and I said, who are you, man? He said, my name's Shane. And he was playing with a little figurine. It was what was called a Huck doll, he told me. It was a Huck doll. And it's like, so you could practice doing tricks. And, uh, and I was like, dude, you guys are awesome. And we started rapping and we became friends. He's like, hey, you want to come to Canada and film us? I was like, yeah, I want to come to Canada and film you guys. And so I was like, okay. I called him and I was like, hey, I'm coming in three weeks. And he was like, oh my God, this guy was serious. He's actually coming. He told me later he thought I would never call him and tell him. So this is spring of 97 while you're making state of mind. While like, you're in the middle of the winter is when you actually connect with everyone. Yes, exactly. For uh-huh. SIA, which was like in the middle of the winter. So I end up showing up in Whistler and I'm thinking, you know, every fourth day is Bluebird. Easy cheesy. We'll go bust out some rad stuff. And it turns out that like I need to get lucky because uh, it's like overcast every single day of the year. <laughs> you only get like 10 sunny days in deep winter, you know. And I ended up getting three sunny days. And we built a quarter pipe. We hit the wind lip. And that was one of the wind lip shots right there. And um, Man, that, that changed my life forever. That, that meeting in Vegas and going to uh, Whistler, I met the entire crew that started actually, you know, transforming skiing. And all those guys you were filming up there, New Canadian Air Force and Zox, the West Coast guys, were they, they were either on national teams or pro mogul ski, right? Like they're yeah, like exactly. one that was like just tricking it up. This was all between practices and contests, right? Or after yeah, this, yeah, as a matter of fact, um, JP and Vincent and JF weren't there. I met uh, Douglas uh, Zox took me around with this kid named Glenn Mittendorfer and some other guys. And it was super fun. They showed me the ropes, but they were all into it. They were all the same, right? Yeah. And, um, and then later on that winter, I met um, JP and those guys. And Mike Douglas basically gave me a tape with some uh, new era stuff on it. And Shane did too. So we combined what they had already filmed with uh with what i shot too and that was state of mind in a nutshell that that was a big change for the world right there yeah at least in our little bubble (laughs) would you say would you say state of mind was a spot for me tape for the fucking whole sport to the industry because that's what i bugged out on today i go and you put out state of mind the combination of the athletes because you make sponsor me tapes right and most of those people didn't have twin tips on and so when I look at that movie, I'm like, yeah, that's like a sponsor me tape saying, hey, create me as a sport. And so like when I look at, and that's my first thing I want to give you props to. And that's why I think like, honestly, because the platform that you created with all these other awesome talents and whatnot, but once that done, you created the platform because everyone can be awesome individually, but someone needs to unite them, bring them together and give them a platform. So when I look at state of mind, I'm like, I want to say thank you to that because I, it was such a basis for every single person, whether they were in that movie. And if they weren't in that movie, they knew about that movie and were in your movie next year. And then it just went like that to whatever you put out. So in my opinion, after thinking about this for multiple days that you have to do the show, you, you and poor boys are the reason our sport exists. <laughs> And when I look at it, because it was a sponsor me tape that like organized everyone together, because no one can accomplish anything solo. I had friends that made twin tips in the early 90s in Minnesota. Griffin and those kids in the fucking Mount Hood area made twin tips in the early 90s. No yeah. one like, blew up the sport unless you are organized and come together. Poor boys did that, man. So when I look at it, you made the illest sponsor me tape for our sport that allowed everyone to be like, let's put a bunch of money into this bitch. And then they did, not only to the skiers, but to the movies, to everything. So thanks, man, because that's how yeah. You're welcome. I don't know if it was exactly me, but thank you. No, it's a group, but you understand it's about bringing people together. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, I think, but, and they, I, no one was united before that. And the first thing where people united in an organization to document tricks in one event or one video, it was that. Because everyone, you have to remember too, I was bugged out. I'm like, everyone quit competition to show their art. Now, you as a movie, an artist painting a picture, making a movie, you painted their pictures for them. But it was a complete picture. Because the, the art is not competing. There was no fucking contest to win a slope style half member big air in 1997. Yep. So you were the only platform. I didn't even know we were a platform. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying, you created I just wanted to one. Showcase. Yeah, you know what? I just wanted to showcase this. I had this feeling about these characters that I had met. And I and just like, I had a love for freestyle and like being loose and having fun. And I think it was, it was lucky. I was stoked to be a part of this whole new thing, you know? Because I'll tell you from my personal point of view, because I say it from what I kind of thought about a bunch in the last couple of days, but then even for me, like the Jenner, right? I didn't see State of Mind as a senior in high school in Minnesota. It wasn't on my radar in fall of 97. But I went to Utah in fall of 98, and, I, and JT Holmes was in my same dorm, and he was 17, he was from Tahoe. He just had his segment with MSP, right, in Global Storm. Right. So I'm 18, he's 17, he'd come over every day and just be like, you guys want to get degenerated? And we watched watch Degenerates on repeat 10 times a day. It would go, Degenerates, Degenerates, Shorty's Fulfill the Dream, for a movie, or a Mac Dog for a movie, whatever came out in 98 as well, and whatever. And so I was like, holy shit, man. Like, for me, like, that motivated me. I watched it every day. My friends, like, I roomed with a couple kids that did tricks from Minnesota, from New Hampshire, from Massachusetts. And, like, everyone was doing the shit in that movie because they were mobile skiers, too. You know, I was, grew up with Shrobs. Like, so, like, we already had, like, elements. And I was like, no fucking way. I used to make VHS and VHS of just the, like, mogul or aerial segments from, like, Warren Miller or stuff movies. And so, like, you made the first movie that I didn't have, like, fast-forward segments. Ever. Ever. And I watched it. I didn't fast-forward stuff segments, but that don't count. I stayed involved because Blake was naked in a mono. And you're like, what the fuck? Oh, Blake. Yeah. So, no, that's pretty wicked, man, because I just can talk from my experience and see, like, the growth of it. Because you did it every year. And every year you motivated... Every year who was in the sport, 97, they were in the movie. And then people that saw your movie and loved it, created a new passion, what did the movie the next year? And then it just kept went like that, maybe until like 1999. And so you had three years where anyone who wanted to do better, be better, be something, went to your platform. That's fucked up. <laughs> it wasn't until like 2000 where like Berman created his own shit or something. You know, Mikey Hill did it, but Mikey Hill was still in your motherfucking movies. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, and he was probably inspired by you and being like, dude, I'll, I, I like 16. I'm going to go do that. So, I mean, like, he was definitely stoked on whatever you created. and Because he was a both in the black and in state of mind. And I think he was in Degenerate. Yep. Yeah. That was pretty good times. So Degenerates was pretty. That was cool because that's the first time we ever, like, really introduced the, the twin tip, you know? Yeah. And that's why I watched that movie 10 times a day. Yeah. Like, day, man. I quit school about camp. Like, a month after I watched this movie for the first time. Like, that's gnarly. I saved over $12,000 that summer working 80 hours a week. And then I spent it all in a semester. And then I said, fuck school. Like, that's wicked. <laughs> wicked. Wicked, wicked. So here's my biggest question, because we're on this time period. So yep. summer of 98, scaffolding, big air, San Diego. Um, X Games. How yep. how do the riders get invited? Like, is it because they see a movie? Like, they're not like. How does it even come on the radar that people are doing tricks in the summer before Degenerates comes out? Before Twin Tips really to the public. You know what? That was kind of like a a Mike Jaquit thing. He was the owner of Freeze Magazine, and Jaquit. Well, I don't know if he was the owner. But it was tra Transworld people owned Freeze, but. Um, he was he was a publisher by Jake Witt, and he had ins. 
and he really pushed hard on the whole free skiing thing back then. Like he was really a conduit to to create a bigger platform for free skiing. He too was like he loved it. I mean, he created Freeze Magazine because he wanted to be part of that whole that whole deal. And for him, it was big mountain skiing. And then he saw he saw the new era coming. And I remember telling Jake with, "Hey, we were at the U.S. Open of skiing. It's when JP and and uh, JF Kusan won back to back in Vail, one one slope, slope style, one one big air, and." Uh, that's where they show the ski, you know, that famous photo of JP with the, the twin tip over his head. That was it. And so they got him. He, he lobbied for it. And basically they said, yes. Big up my Jake with then because like, man, for everyone who's all stoked on scaffolding events in 2022, that's watching us. Like it was happening in 1998 at X, Summer X Games with skiers and in, in San Diego and then the next in 1999 in San Francisco. It was yep. fucking epic. It was pretty epic. It was a massive structure. It was almost scary to be on that thing. At least they didn't have a gap. <laughs> yep. What? Oh, man, you know what I have right here? I have my first piece of memorabilia that we get to share with people. So tell me if you know what this is. I know what it is. What is it? JF Kusan, Oakley, Poster. Yeah, that oh, was the. That, uh, it's better than that, Johnny. Yeah, it was the invite. Yeah, for the premiere of 13 at the Oakley factory. Yeah, this is mint condition. Well, this that's is pretty good that you have that. <laughs> oh, I got more of my friends. Like, we'll get to them as we go on. I got that a was good a two wild event. For all, those who like, for all those who like partying, that was a wild event. Oh, there I got a more <laughs> wild event rolled up right here to show you later. Oh, boy. There was an earthquake. There was Falou and Vinny got kicked out. They got brought back in. We destroyed the factory. They banned ski movies from Oakley for the next five years. That was a good night. It was amazing. That was my first time. You flew me out. Like I got a yeah. I, yeah. It was a highlight, man. I was ne I never was in California. I was never in an earthquake before. Never had a premiere before. Never in LA before. It was. Just like fucking awesomeness. That was in less than one year from when I quit school and bought a camera. About ten good. months later, you were a part of it. You shot a lot. You you brought in the Tanner Hall. You know, I I had met Tanner Hall uh, on the hill for Degenerates. Yeah. And it was Shane Zox who was like, "Hey, you should film this kid. He's really good. He's over at uh, Smarts Camp. Uh, he's kind of a wild little kid with funny hair." I was like, all right, let's, let's try and get some young kid in the movies. And I went over and I shot him and I was like, holy moly, this kid's really good. And he only had like four or five yeah. shots, four or five shots, but that changed everything. That Those four or five shots made a whole different career path, I think, for Tanner. And it was the mogul world, too, because at that time period in 98, it was so fun because you knew everyone, right? So mogul people all knew about when he's like 96. Because you're like, yeah. man, that guy skis on skis that are like a foot taller than his head. And he springboards the first jump, like, because he does reverse camp flops. And, like, JF was doing rodeos at, like, the um, uh, Sunday River fucking, what was that, like, awesome mogul event that they used to have out east? Oh, they used to have the bumps and jumps or something? I don't know. They had the pro jumps, though. Yeah. Like, the the step downs. And Kusan oh. did, like, a rodeo off that shit, like, in 96 or something. Yep. 98. So, yeah, you know, so, like, I don't know, like, the mogul world is fun because Tanner was the kid that threw sevens in the bumps since he was, like, 12 with the same little red hat about half the size yeah. of him. And I I was stoked to meet him, and he was super nice, and he was funny, and that was Tanner's deal. And you took it over and blew it up to the high hats. We had a bunch of awesome people, though. I got to shoot a bunch of Scotty Myers segment for that movie, if not all of it. And then yep. uh, who else was fucking awesome. I don't know, but big up Scotty Meyer. Big up Eric Craighead, because I think of four boys, I think Eric Craighead at the beginning. Yeah, Craighead. He helped a lot, too. We had a lot. You know, this was more like a team thing, you know? It was, it was a big community at the time. So much, just VX, VX1000s, VX1000s, fire wires. Can I get your shot? 
Hell yeah, you can. Dave Levin, too, huh? Dave Levin, well researching you today. It was awesome. Like, I ended up on a Levin New Schoolers interview from 20 years ago. It was at the, in my closet right beside me that year at Mammoth. Oh, I, I this was happening. Big up Levin. He's a fucking mastermind of weirdness. Yes, he's a legend. Fuck, Phil, can you say any words, man? I want you to say something. Oh, hit us with your description. Oh, nice. He's talking oh, like a style. No, we talk every show. Uh, Phil asks, like, I don't know, because everyone we, everyone we interview, like, you're, you're picked because you have style, Johnny. Like, it's not just because of your accomplishments so well, because your movies had style, you know, like, whatever you've done in your career, like, we've done windsurfing, it's your style. People you work with, it's your style. So that's a big reason you're selected as well as everything you've done. Because um, it makes you unique. And so what's your, what's your definition of style? Or what, how would you define your style if you did? Either or. My style? I don't know. I was pretty punk rock back in the day, to be honest. Like, I liked it. I, you know, style came from... There was something about ski back in the day. Like, when I first started, that was so uptight, you know? And I came from surfing. And I always said, I'm going to bring surfing to the snow. Because it should be going hand in hand, you know? And surfing and skiing are the same. Like, way back in the day, they were very together. And then it became snowboarding. But I was like, dude, I'm going to bring surf culture to the snow. And that's kind of like... My first movies were very like that style, but style in general is just I, when I, if you were to say style, and I think back in the day, Kusan had a style. He had like highest a, level. Highest level, different from everybody that was in the movies. Like he had his own thing going on. I, 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 let's, let's talk about him for a second because he'll be the out of our list of 100 people we want on the show he will be the most difficult I think to get on it so I want you to give there him he is. on this show because I think you know him the most out of anyone from an outside source not growing up like yeah. why was Kusan so dope man like what like what was your theory he didn't give an F dude he didn't he didn't care that's what was cool about Kusan. He, he did it because it was awesome, not because he, he did it for himself. You know what I mean? He did it because yeah. he wanted to do it. He didn't do it for anybody else, which was really kind of rare. You know, you're always trying to get something out of something. But he didn't care. He just wanted to do it because it was, it was like this. He's an alpha, let's put it that way. He's a trend setter, not a trend follower. That's what I was And, he was, and he was the best mogul skier out of them all, wasn't he? He was like yeah, the guy that was going to be the fucking man of next oh, year. Yeah, not Luke. yeah he, he had it. He was the best out of those guys. Or at least right there. You know, JP was really good. Kusan was the guy. But yeah. he, he didn't follow rules. He couldn't. He couldn't deal. <laughs> he couldn't handle the World Cup stuff. He was over it. No, they all, but it was like, that's, I don't know, that's why everything was created. It was, the rules are ridiculous when you get break, break in form. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you're in upright aerials, if, if you crunch your knees, it's break in form. If you grab your skis until like 1999, 2000, it was break in form until after mostly. Because they're just like, oh, that's a tip cross with a break in form. Why did he touch his knees? And so, yeah. like, there's just so many things that was stupid. And they pushed it to be stupid until, like, mostly it was finally like, stupid. And then it's too late. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even watching that video, I, I look back and I'm like, damn, son, I can stop. It's cool. Like, like Phil, you know, Phil's got us very unique style like your style is very unique and amazing it's hard to copy you know? thank you impossible very impossible you, you've got your thing and i think this you know like kusan too he was the one who had his thing um dishno had his thing it's like 
a couple guys just have their thing, you know, and it's like, you can't copy it, you can only, you can only take inspiration from it, if that makes sense. What's the craziest thing you ever saw Kusan do on skis? Kusan? Yeah. You know what's interesting about Kusan is he was like a cat, you know what I'm saying? He was like a cat. He did like a 720 rodeo for it. He was like, okay, I'm going to do this rodeo. And that was before rodeos were really like, that was like a huge, huge trick. And I remember he over-rotated it a little bit, but he just kept going and went to nine and, we, and landed butter. It's like, okay. You know, and these days, you know, people over-rotate a little bit and they just keep going. They come up yeah. short, they do a weird thing to stop themselves. You know, just like, land sideways. That's cool. With the nose press. Yeah, there's like all kinds of crazy stuff. But he was doing that back then, which was completely nuts. Craziest thing I ever saw him do is the shot that we were just watching from Gravity Games 2000. So it's my shot and your movie in the game. And it's straight on. And he caught his edge going into that takeoff. And it fucking like, he gets so bucked at that shot right there. So he catches his edge. That's why there's so much snow. He gets all fucked up. And I'm watching it through my camera. I'm like, yo, what the hell's going on? He should die. Because I've never seen no one catch their edge like that in my life. And that was the biggest jump I've seen in my life to that day. You know? And yeah, it was wicked. Didn't he win? Yeah. I can watch that over and over. Did he win? No, dude. He, he lived. He was like one of... <laughs> remember? I don't know if you were there, but I think everyone went to a hospital that night. Oh, Holmes God. went to a hospital. Dion went to a hospital. Rory went hospital everyone got an ambulance all the ambulances were done and jp won that night huh candide won oh candide johnny, johnny I, that's Ivan. fun with a title card <laughs> great interview oh man where did i meet you Iver? i would uh, guess it's us open 99 because I showed up with Tanner, if you can hear me. So I showed up with Tanner in 99, and I was filming with him, and I was working on a movie, Wreck the Snowman. My shit was called 40 Ounce Film. Oh, yeah. What? 40 Ounce <laughs> Film. And, um, and so I was doing that, and then I told you what I was doing, because not many of us were filming. And then blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, yeah, man, stay in touch. And then that, uh, oh, you're fucking loot. So... I met you at US Open 1999. Like, we talked about making movies. I told you I was making a movie, like, dick. And then I went to summer camp, like, that year with John Turkula. And then, um, yeah, we just talked. I'm like, man, I don't know how to edit. I just could buy a camera. And then I was like, I'll give you all my footage. And then I gave you, like, just all my footage that summer. That was pretty yeah. bad. No, no. Yeah, that's it. We made a good segment of Tanner, yeah? We had a lot of good segments, before. man. Like I, I think, no, that, that movie, I got like 70-some shots in it. I was so stoked. It was the best free shit I ever gave to anyone yeah, in my life. Yeah, that was, that, that made the movie. That, if I didn't have your shots, that movie wouldn't work. Fucking awesome, man. 13, went to the premiere. Yeah. Chrissy well, Lesko, well, she was right beside the poster. I don't know if anyone's been noticing. This is a 2002 Nordica eight-page spread in Free Skier Magazine. Pretty epic. She was a skier. Yes. Christy. Third. What, what do we got, Phil? Man, that was, that was a good one. Um, let me um, formulate this. Yeah, the concept... Okay. Give us the concept behind the movie, the game, uh, as far as each skier competing for a prize purse and where that went. They what end up J questioning it like Kusan we talked is about on. it. Kusan. No. What? Kusan. Call Kusan in right now, man. This is an unrealistic moment. Call Kusan. <laughs> this is the best part about the live show is we get some awesome random calls sometimes. But if he answers... Epic. jump on. Yeah. We said his name enough. He appeared. It's like Be Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I just threw you a bunch. He is invited. 
Well, Johnny's going to break up in that LA traffic, man, right? When Kusan drops in. Oh, no way. All right, Johnny. Yeah. You, while we wait for, while we wait for Kusan, can you uh, give us kind of why you created the game? Because it was a super interesting concept, and I guess it I makes people it. kind of push themselves. But yeah, I had seen like I don't know where it was, what sport, maybe surfing, but I had seen like a video contest, and I was like, dude, you should do that for skiing. I really want to do that, and. I don't know. I was talking to JP with Mike Douglas and those guys, and I told him, "Hey, listen, I want to do. I want to make a video, and whoever makes the best segment gets a prize purse." And they were like, "Dude, let's go!" So everyone was kind of stoked on it. We went for it. Oh, there he is. So the con concept was you film your best segment and. Votes on them then. Yeah, so we put actually vote cards in the VHS box with a pre stamp on it, or I think we stamp it, I can't remember. But you sent it back in, and we got all these freaking cards back. It was crazy. How many do you think you got back? 200, which was amazing. I didn't think we'd get that many cards back, but I think we got like 200 back. That was a sick sheet right there. Phil's got the poster, man. It's authentic in his house. No way. I got the gift from the we authentic. Yeah, we gave those posters out. Movies. We did some cool stuff. Like we used to give DVDs of the soundtrack. We used to give posters of the films. We tried to go all the way. Speaking of soundtracks, how did uh, you have certain criteria for sound choice? Or how did you balance the soundtrack through the movies? Because it seemed like it flowed so well and there was the right balance of punk, rock, and hip-hop. Yeah, I mean, that was it. We didn't want to be just one side or the other. We definitely liked music. I used to listen to thousands of songs and all the guys basically always ask them, you know, what kind of music do you like? Like, JP always picked his own music. And for Dusan, I think I, I picked uh, a track that he loved once, Propaganda. It was like, that was a really big segment for Dusan. Um, yeah, that was pretty much awesome. And all, all the soundtracks, you just tried to... Pretty big punk rock guy balance. for the first couple of years. Yeah, I was really into it. But then we wanted to... Uh, we wanted to just basically expand everything and I started liking other types of music too so you know I wanted to bring that into it and also I let the boys do their thing as well like how hard was that though for you like because you were pretty le trying to be legit like how much money did you use to spend on soundtracks because I stole all my music because I knew there wasn't money. But, like, how much were you spending when you all of a sudden started getting sponsor checks? And, like, say, let's say the game. Because you had some dope ass songs in the game. How much money yeah. do you think you spent? Man, I don't even know. But we spent a lot of money on soundtracks. Like, these people would be like, oh, you didn't even pay for that. I was like, actually, I did. I did pay for that. Or at least I intended to pay for that. Like, sometimes <laughs> there was a few back in the day where they just. They never sent us an invoice. Well, like, what was our guy's name? <laughs> what what was the music? Chad guy? Davis. Chad Davis. Chad Davis. Davis. Big up Chad Davis, man. Yeah. He helped us a lot, man. He made like eight movies for us, probably, with soundtracks. He's the man. And he always gave us fresh music, and, and you'd go after things that we wanted, which was super cool. Was, that a, yeah. was music ever a problem in making your movies? Like stuff you wanted, or like, did anything ever cause a conflict? You had to change the song last minute, or anything weird like that? Oh man, we changed so many songs last minute. People get so pissed. Like we told a writer they had it, they watched the segment, and then at the last minute we get declined or something. We're like, sorry, bro, we gotta give you something different. What's your like, worst? You what, what's your worst one that you had to tell a writer that you changed? I think it was Tanner. He was so Come pissed on, at Tyler. <laughs> It was some song that he wanted, and then 
oh, what song was it? And in the end, we had to change it last second. He was freaking pissed. I remember that. I felt bad. Yeah. But sometimes it's expensive nothing sometimes. to do. You know? Nothing. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. And the distributors are like, you need that movie now. So like, yeah. dude, I, I need more time. Like, there's no more time. And we want that paperwork. They want that paperwork. But, you know, we try to stay as true as we can. Our motto is true to the movement. I don't know if you remember that. True to the movement, the new movement of skiing. It's always called true to the movement. It's our motto back in the day. Yeah. And we tried as hard as we could. Stay true. Happy day. Montreal. World premiere. That's such a sick shot. I found the ticket too. <laughs> tell us one. about you guys tell us about the founding of Armada both of you guys were instrumental to it I believe so I'm going to tell the whole story tonight Johnny I just told Phil about it today and no one All right. are you ready to tell yeah. the world the truth yeah tell them awesome so Johnny DeCesare is the original founder of Armada and that's something that's never been talked about. And it's something that's super important because it plays as big a role as Tanner. It plays as big a role as O'Connell and the, all the covers we got on Free Skier and Freeze from 2003 to 2006. It plays as big a role as the contest wins and et cetera. So this is something I really want to make sure you get your flowers for because when I look back as a, someone who made films and, and know what it means to give up space to six athletes in a humongous film on the release of the year because you're an owner like the value that you put into the company was hundreds of thousands of dollars right and it was pretty crazy so like i guess i just wanted the people to know like 9d was the original founder of armada has never been written or talked about his role was to give exposure to our athletes, like and make sure they're seen out there because he worked with them since day one. And it was kind of the biggest reason it was quiet was because you were a founding member and you couldn't tell people like other sponsors because most people pay to play. Yeah. And so I don't know if I blew your cover 20 years later, it was 20 years later. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Big up Johnny. Uh -huh. We gone tomorrow, man. Everyone needs to know, man, you're as big a part as every single foundation member, Tanner, Kusan, Jaya, JP, Shukia, Hans, Chris, you know, Boyd, Clark, Anthony, myself. Like, I want to thank you personally. You know, if no one ever has, I want to thank you for the sport because we won C6 Armada Skeeters in an Oakley movie in 2003. If it wasn't for Johnny DeCesare and Four Voice Productions and your part in Armada, and um, yeah, man, that's my ramble to just say thank you. I don't know if we're supposed to talk about that, but um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, more thanks, of, bro. if it didn't exist and no one talks about it, I think that's unfair to you. Because to me, when I look at it, like that's an investment of ten, hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years. From 1242, happy day shots, fucking like even the dub ski and whatever you had in uh, 2004. So. Yeah, man, big up yourself on all you did because I know, like, as a business person, you had to evaluate what your investment was in order to have toilet paper, a.k.a. shares or something. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, that was a cool, that was a weird time, huh? Because we had Solomon was such a big sponsor and I didn't want to blow it. So I just didn't say anything to anyone. But the deal was exposure and you had a part of the company original when they formed it i was a video partner and yourself but, so, yeah. so were you stoked i guess since it's never been talked about i had never even talked about it with you in my life and i don't know if anyone else has but like so when you got involved and like i knew about it but it wasn't something i discussed it was something that like i think o'connell and you created but like when you signed up to, and i don't even know if all the athletes know to be honest maybe I don't know. <laughs> you know, I know julian knows you know but um like, was it, were you stoked on it? Like, you were part of helping create the sport through a visual, but then be part of a ski movement, but then be quiet about it? Like, did you feel a sense of pride? Were you stoked? Were you whatever? Were you stressed? Like, what was it like for you as an owner? And a oh, I was always stoked, you know? I always supported Armada. It was like, it was always kind of like, 
blood for me, you know. I loved Armada and everything about it. Still do. Still love Armada. And I was just trying to be good to Solomon because they were the ones who, like, really made our company happen, you know. So I And make a problem, too, because they invested in the sport. If we look at how much money they put in your film, JF, JP, Vinny, they weren't making that much money off twin tip sales as much as no. they invested. So when I look back at it, like all the companies we hated that we want to start our own company, and you're like, whoa, all they did was make money in our sport, and we still hate them, and we wanted a third size twin tip because we hated the 180, 165 option. It's just funny now when you look back because it was only investment money. And they believed in what you created enough to put investment money in you and the athletes that you put on a screen. It was fucking awesome, man. Yeah, so, man. We yeah, they were salt. good. They were super good. And I and I was stoked with Armada. I was just happy to like be a part of it and try and you know make something bigger out of the whole ski industry. I always said like even with Berman or anybody else, I always said it's not competition. It's just making the pool bigger. Yeah, um, make it. Don't take a piece of the pie. Make the pie bigger, man. That's it. It's so not small. like someone's. No one's ever taken from me. I always encouraged other ski companies, cinema, you know, other cinematographers. I wanted to make ski films. I always encouraged them. I never wanted to take away from them. You know, I was. I never saw them as like massive competition. I would just saw them as making the, the ski scene bigger. You know. Yeah. And that means it is bigger if there's enough room for another person to make a movie. And something sick too, like I thought about, like, so say, let's say it's 1997, you're making State of Mind. So like when I made Royalty, there was four 16 meter films in the United States of America, right? In 2001. So I was like, all right, that's interesting. I always thought that was kind of fun, you know? And then like, when I thought about you, I was like in 1997, State of mind, I was like, man, you were the only movie that did twisted maneuvers in it. You know, and then we got Degenerate, same thing, 1990. In the year 2005, I think there was close to 200 worldwide DVDs of only twin tip e movies. Like, I had one from every region of the fucking world that year. I had the biggest archive, like, whether it's a Minnesota movie, whether it's a crew in Switzerland whether it's whoever like so i thought that was pretty awesome because if you were the first that's like here's this on a pedestal and then he would go from like how small was this world for decades it's Not crazy like, huh? uh, right the type genre so you you created a whole genre within ski films and you can say that Oof. you know and then not only that because i can show you in a, in a whole timeline, the movies that came out after 1997, you know, like the only one that we could, was Hill, Hill's first one was 98. Yeah, the first one. So even that one was 98 and then 99. That's crazy. Yeah, it's fucking wicked. So you need to know that too. Like that's nuts. If you were the first person in one only dedicated to tricks, and then it like seven years later, there's hundreds globally. There's nowhere else we could get awesome videos like that previous. <laughs> That's funny, man. I remember it. It was in uh, in France. You know how they had the uh, IF3 festival uh, back then? I remember he said there was 200 ski films entered. There was even more submitted, but they didn't take them all. I was like, what? That was massive. That's crazy. Yeah, it was trippy. So so, I mean, it's more of a fusion now, and I only used that time period until 2005 because in 2005, every video I'm talking about was only tricks, urban and terrain park, and backcountry kickers, right? Huh. So now, yeah. like all the movies that are submitted, is a big fusion of all types of skiing and everything. But I'm saying, what you created such a genre with trick, 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 trick. Yeah, man, there was lots of going on. Yeah, that was fun. I like it. That was my style, dude. That was it. You know what? So, you know, now that we're on Armada and we were on 1242 mm -hmm. a year, so 1242 might be one of the weakest things. The next thing I found, tell me if you remember this. What is that? This is the flyer we hung up in every place in Newport Beach for the after party at the house we rented. 
<laughs> after the world premiere, which we totally destroyed with just people puking all over with the address printed on the flyer. Like a thousand people came to your after party at their Mata house. It was fucking awesome. Oh, that's so funny. Like the bat, like I, yeah, I can't imagine now to go around and just put things on the flagpole. Like we just went around on every telephone pole that afternoon. So many people came. I think cops came. Like, it was a oh, rock, dude. That was that was pretty fun times. That shot. There was a there was a temperature inversion that day at Jackson Hole. It was minus thirty down below. It was about thirty degrees on top of the mountain. I burned off all the inside stuff on my lens, the condensation. People said, what are you doing? I said, I got a lighter. Got the shot. <laughs> got the shot. Oh, there he is. What else we got, Phil? Yeah, 1242. Oh, big up yourself, Tana. You got a good song in that movie. Greta oh, voted wow. for Phil Poirier in the game. Oh, we got to go back to the game. Um, we're going back there because I thought it was fun. So the game happened. My biggest memory is telling Phil. So the winner of the game was a knock at the U.S. Open in uh, 2001. And I remember JP like won and he threw some skis to the crowd, cut someone's hand open. There's blood everywhere. That was my personal memory. Now the next memory was years later that I learned that the money never got paid. Is that yeah. true? Did JP, the winner of the game, not get paid? Yeah, he's like, ah, oh, keep it, dude. It wasn't that much, so he just said, keep it. He's like, put it into the movie. Yeah. And that's what's sick, too, because I learned that. And it's just like, of course, we never make money. We always spend money on our movies, so there's not a paycheck at the end. And there's a paycheck. So that shows kind of, but JP was so involved. Big up JP at this time. And I'm going to use this time for you. I guess it's a great transition, because JP was such a big part of Four Boys. Like, such yep. a humongous part. And, like, every time I was down there, like, from the first couple of years, or, like, even when I see him, we only talk four boys' movies. Like, plus the editing, plus the song, who has dope segments. So I guess, man, like, I would like to give a platform for you now to say, like, I don't know, something about JP. Because, like, to you and poor boy, to me, it was kind of the same thing. He was, like, your, how the fills were to me at the beginning. That's kind of reminded me, like, how JP was with you. Like, he had your back on every fucking thing, no matter what. Oh, no, Johnny's got this. So, uh, oh, man, what have you got to say about JP and Four Boys? Yeah, JP was like a brother to me. He was, he was the best. You know, I first met JP and Dale at a coffee shop. Uh, Zox brought him over, and we did that shooting bail that one year. And, uh, he didn't even speak that good in English. He just said, everything I said, he just said, okay, okay. It was super funny. So, I don't know. We ended up being friends, and he ended up, over all the years, he was so creative that he always came, and he would edit at our house. He would stay a month. He would stay more and edit. He just he just became poor boys. He was just ingrained in poor boys. He invested in us just like we invested in him. You know, he was, he just became part of it. Yeah. And that's, you know, he became such a good friend. And, you know, it's still weird because he, he was a big influence on poor boys and myself. His vision would like change some of my thoughts. He'd be like, but Johnny, why not look at it this way? Look at it that way. And I'd be like, oh. I never, I never looked that direction. I never turned that corner. He was so good. It's so, he's so creative. He also taught me, I mean, I was always a hard worker, you know, from the beginning. Like I was never scared to, to work hard, but JP took it to the next level and he showed me what you can do when you work, not just hard, but like ridiculous. And so I learned that from JP too. And uh, he was always, he was always like, yeah, it'll work. It'll work. It's fine. It'll work. You know? So, I don't know. I learned a lot from JP. I think we learned from each other. But uh, I certainly learned a lot from Jip. He was a good one. His passing, you know, still, to this day, I don't, I don't believe it. Like, it's not real that JP left us. Like, to this day, I'm still, like, weirded out by JP's like 
death. It's so strange to me. Like, it's not like real. It's, it's strange. It's, it's like, I still think he's in Canada. Yeah. I'm waiting, like, gonna give you a call or something. No, I hear you. Because he's just, I know it's like a spirit still there because he's just like, you can imagine what he'd say. Because like, hey! it doesn't matter if you don't see him for a day or a year or four years. It's always like the same thing. And I don't know, same way we talk, you know? Like, whatever it's going yeah. to be. So, like, if it's all of a sudden they're gone for a while, like, you're just like, yeah, but that's normal. And then they pop up and they're still awesome. <laughs> that's so true, man. That's it. That's it. Oh, that's funny. That was a really funny segment right there. Yeah. So now I'm going to teach you the Misty 720. Today we're going to teach you how to really shake the turn by putting pressure on the front of your skate. We're also going to teach you Misty Clip 720. Oh, see, we mute the sound in case they all of a sudden shut us down on the Instagram. Oh, yeah. Ah, that's funny. He had style, too. He had a different style, different than everyone else. He was all about the tweak. He was a tweaker. He was a tweaker. He always said, it's all about the tweak. He did mean hunting. Me. Mean hunting. Me. You know, like new kids, bring a hunting back, man. It's been like two decades since someone's done a dope hunting. Me. I saw one the other day. Where did I see it? I saw oh. one in some some trailer or something. I was like, whoa, they brought it back. I want to All see I it know again. is I tried one once when I saw it originally, and I think I put an edge in my kneecap. And I said, that's freaking cool. <laughs> Phil, can you do a hunt knee? Nope. <laughs> not, especially not after two blown knees. Uh, could you ever do one? Uh, never did it. Yeah, see? It, were, were you ever into the fill grab, Phil? You know what? No, unfortunately. Such a bummer. Phil should always do <laughs> Like, every Phil watching this in Quebec right now, all 15 of you, which is a 15 out of 25, should be doing fill grabs. Uh, that's yeah. funny. I want to hear uh, the trade-off of Mikhail shots against uh iberg labor so you yeah. know this story johnny so this is one of my highlights in life so like so when, I made, so when i made royalty like we're we're talking and so i was just like man i want mikhail exclusive and i was all adamant about it and you had like two shots from japan on a quarter pipe and one from mammoth on a rodeo and I'm like, I'll give you all my shots I got this year, and I'll come down and edit if I can have Mikel fucking exclusive. <laughs> so I ended up for propaganda. I edited six segments in that movie. I gave you 45 shots. You shot one trick of the year with a Switch Misty 9 from uh, Mount Hood. All yeah. Mikel shots, man. Give thanks. <laughs> that was the best trade ever in the history of trades. <laughs> but, you know, what's funny about that is that I don't think I would have finished propaganda if you didn't come out, dude. It was that was not easy. Oh, it's so fun. I just that remember you having it and you're like, you can't edit three segments in a day. And I'm like, I edited my whole movie last week in two days. And you're like, that's not how movie making works. I'm like, yeah, but this Pollard and Mike Nick segment's dope. And you're like, you did it in thirty minutes. Maybe watch it a couple more times. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. You ever sleeping on the floor? It was awesome. I remember a Mexican restaurant. So again, oh, man. So sit, funny. Oh, you sat on the end of your bed to edit it in your bedroom. Because yeah. the computer was like a little thing in your bed. That's when we had Final Cut 1. It was Final uh, yeah. Cut 1. Oh, uh, yeah, we did. Got a, got a new computer system. It was Final Cut 1. I remember it to this day. And I remember having to remake a bunch of segments because we lost something. I don't know what happened in the system, but... The Matrix died. We lost a couple segments. I had to remake them. But, you know, that movie, JP, I mean, no, uh, JF Kusan was, like, super, super emotional when he saw that segment in the end because I put his shots over the, uh, remember when he jumped the house? JP jumping in the house? You remember when he, no, JF, JF jumped in the house. Yeah. 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 I remember I, I didn't put it in because he didn't land it perfect, and I was pretty gnarly back then. And uh, 
It's like, ah, you didn't land that that good. It's like, dude, I worked so hard to get that shot. And we made a funny intro with Micah Abrams. And in the end, you really, that segment meant a lot to him. I remember it. He went off in that segment. Yeah, back then, those tricks were huge. There's the house jump right there. The talking about right good. Now? Good. Good. Look at that thing. It was massive. Yeah, that's fucked up. I watched that the other day. I was like, man, like you get a bomb that hole in, run through some shit, and roof to roof to roof. Yeah, because I showed him his segment. He came and he came to the house. He made a segment with me, and I was like, we're done. And he's like, dude. And he and he pleaded with me. Went back to Quebec. He called me from Quebec, and he's like. Hey, Johnny, listen, man, it would mean so much if you just put those three shots in. I was like, bro, there's no space. Where do you want me to put them? The song doesn't get any longer. And he's like, Johnny, and I remember this to this day, and I tell kids this all the freaking time. I tell my daughter, I tell everyone, anyone in filmmaking, because of JP, uh, JF. And he goes, Johnny, you know, it's just a puzzle, man. It's just a puzzle you got to figure out and reshuffle it a little bit to make it fit. You can put the three shots in without losing anything else. And I was like, uh, what? He's like, you got it. It's just a puzzle, John. You can make it work. <laughs> and I and I fiddle with it for like two days, and I finally made it work. And he was so happy. Nice work, buddy. Uh, he was crying in the bathroom, I remember it. Fucking Kusan's crying in the bathroom and not answering his phone. <laughs> Where is that guy? Oh, no. He came quick and then everyone noticed him, I think, and then he ran away. Look at that. That was nuts. But we have Yannick B here. i seen him show oh, up. I love Yannick. Where are you, Yannick? Still there? You should bring Yannick on. He's been on. We did a show with him. He shows up sometimes. He has a great re You know who we got next week? Roy Silva. Oh, Roy Silva. Hey, see that? rail right there it took tucson like two days to make that yeah, still here oh shit you know what that means it's Yannick motherfucking b the reoccurring figure from quebec Trampoline. there he is <laughs> How's that beard, yo? i was i was thinking i'm still wearing oh shit where is it still wearing a, a shirt a hood the shirt that jp gave me probably 15 years ago <laughs> <laughs> full circle that's so funny. Nice. That's cool. Well, Yannick, Thanks. welcome to our show. This is Yannick B. We've had him as our guest before. Phil can't talk. That's why he claps. But so, Yannick, well, why don't we talk about Johnny here since you're here? Like you as a young ski boarder growing up, as a, coming into the ski scene, what were your thoughts on the big guy in the Cesare and Poor Boys productions? <laughs> it was always, like, I, I don't know the first time I met Johnny, but... I remember I, when I went on Solomon for skiing, when I moved back to skiing, like I was kind of like on the line, like all the big, like JP, JF, like they were all full on Solomon and they were in Johnny's movie. And that's when I think, that's when I think you um, started doing movies with Johnny and, and Johnny started splitting some of the, like the, like less known athletes to that to that movie and keeping the other ones but i was like even doing that i was so happy to to be doing movies with with um poor boys because that was always like for me when i started skiing that was one of the like idol of of like all the movies from poor boys were always the cool movie compared to other movies usually <laughs> so Hell and then yeah. I got to, and then I got to, to know Johnny more and travel more and meet more on the road and and realize he was a pretty cool dude. So so. <laughs> <laughs> you too, Yannick. You're awesome. Yeah, I had the chance a couple of years ago. I went to Hawaii with the family, and Johnny was filming. Um, what were you filming? Oh, you were filming the movie with a. Uh, Kai. Uh, with, uh, with Kai, yeah. Oh, um, Kai and then we hooked up and went to uh, a taco place, I think. It was kind of nice to see Johnny after probably years. Last time, I think the, the time before that I last saw you was, was 
at um, JP's memorial. So it was nice to be in other mm. situations. <laughs> oh, oh man, yeah. got Sammy Carlson on here too. This is nuts. You but know, Mr. Deconic, we're going to on. Sammy, we're calling him, and then we're going to keep going. Right. He still lost his voice, and we're already at an hour and a half. But Yannick, next week is Silva. Who do we got now? Is that Johnny walking? Yeah, I'm going up. All right. Here. You got to fucking call on Sammy, man. Sammy is huge with poor boys and Johnny. Sammy, answer your phone, buddy. You just Come got new Sammy. that came out. Man, have you watched Sammy's new segment, Johnny? Yep, I did. I watched it today. Okay. Yep. I actually sent him a message. Answer. Phil's calling you. Call. Come on, Sammy. You know who else is here? Motherfucking Levin. Levin, stick around. We're calling you too. This is oh, yeah. Cool. Johnny's at home now. And if yes. Sammy can to go to <laughs> Levin, you can call in. And then Phil can see you. And then he can accept your call. Keep them. I don't have any more shit, man. I got them, but I didn't unpack them. Hey, Phil, what are we missing while we wait for random people to Levin, call. Levin. Levin. Oh my God, there's so many stories about Levin. There he is. Oh my God. Levin. What's up, y'all? Yeah. Life is up. How are you, David? I got mine over here. Don't worry. Good. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing well. How are y'all doing? Excellent. I'm so stoked you called. So we're just going to go straight to it, Levin. You're a filmmaker. We the same game. I, I was a filmmaker. <laughs> no, it was a turtle. We're, on, I, we're in a ski world. We're on Casablanca. So you're, I, you're I a former would, snow ski filmmaker. That's awesome. Blum, scandalous. Check it out, people. I was, a, I, was a, I was a digital video maker. Man. I was never you, cool enough or had enough budget to actually make films. No, but you edited a lot of film. That's so true. Yeah, I, I read an article from you on New Schoolers today from 19 years ago. You just talked shit on yourself the whole time. It was the funniest shit I ever read in my life. So, <laughs> makes sense. So, Levin, tell us a Johnny story of four boys. Like, I guess I want to ask you because, like, you got stoked on skiing. You were as passionate as I was about it, filming it and doing all that. Why do you think Johnny mattered in, our, in twin tip skiing at the time or just in general? Tell them how we met. Yeah. So I met Johnny circa 2001 or two, maybe. And I had like just graduated high school. I grew up in Southern California and skiing wasn't really a thing in Southern California. It was very much snowboarding. And um, I was working at a ski shop and I heard that there was this going to be a premiere for this movie called 13. And it was at the Oakley factory. And I'm pretty sure I just sent Johnny an email. I was like, Hey man, I live in Southern California and I like to ski. Can I come to your movie premiere? And he's like, yeah, come to my movie premiere. And so it was at the Oakley factory, which is like just, you know, up the street in Orange County. And I went there and I met Johnny and like all of the legends were there. And I just kind of kept to myself. And that was a, that was a wild experience. And so then the next winter I moved up to Mammoth. Uh, and I actually thought I was going to be a professional skier but that was the year that like Tanner and like everybody else moved to Mammoth. And I was like, well, I'm definitely not going to be a professional skier. <laughs> so I got a, I had a little mini like single chip DV camera and I got the, like the first iMac that you could plug in a firewire to. And, um, you know, I just met all these gears that were there in Mammoth and we hung out and we shot video and, um, I met Johnny and I, I was like, Hey man, we, I met you at your premiere. And uh, check this thing out. I got like the first ever DVDR where I could like write a DVD. I'm like, hey, do you want to like put your like you want to put your teaser on a DVD? And Johnny was like, yeah, let's put put the teaser on a DVD. So I made. So DVD this is DVD. when you lived in the closet. Yeah, no, this is this is when I lived in like the hallway with Eric Spreed. So this is 2001 <laughs> then, because we lived together in 2002. Yeah, I lived in the closet the next year with you and, and the gang. God, that was so the year before funny. that. Yeah, so it was really fun. That 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 summer, I started. You know, I came back to Southern California and was editing film with Johnny, and 
um, Johnny was kind of like my idol, and I realized that he just needed a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> More than I so, could. Yeah. I, ever so, did. I needed all the help I could handle. And so I went to Johnny's house and, you know, spent the summer there with him, and like JP was there and uh, Greg Heidel, and basically Johnny just rationed us like grilled cheese sandwiches. And we just ate grilled cheese sandwiches and edited. I think we were editing Happy Days maybe at that time. I don't remember. Yeah, it was Happy Days. Happy yeah. Days. So that was uh, that was my origin story with Johnny. And I hats off to you, buddy. Thanks for everything. That's, hey, that's when the uh, the movies got better in terms of the editing. <laughs> Levin was an amazing editor. Just so you guys know, Levin was like edited a bunch of our films, a bunch. Levin did so much. Levin was like a secretary. I mean, like Levin, like, yeah. He did Levin all. Was like the, like, Levin was like Tyler and Cody before Tyler and Cody existed when Tyler and Cody couldn't exist in Four Boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's it. And we also had, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Champagne. Champagne. Uh, Carl. 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 Carl Jacobson. Carl Jacobson. He's a teacher was of Spanish epic. in Iowa. Yes. Carl was amazing back then. Oh, man. Who, yeah. who's, even, who's even watching this thing? Oh, my mom's watching. Hi, Mom. That's there right. You go. Peter Souls is watching. Hi, Peter. Hi, Greta. Yep. Nice no, to I see thought you. It was like Sonic the Hedgehog. Kusan showed up for a minute. So you, we get some in and outs because we go for like two hours, Dave. Is, is, uh, is, is Yannick still here? I've got, I've got fun stories about Yannick. Yannick and um, I forget the photographer's name when we were living in Whistler, like everybody was just trying to learn how to ride snowmobiles. We were all just getting stuck in tree wells. <laughs> how did Yannick do? Yeah, he was like doubling around with the photographer and just getting stuck in tree wells. It was oh, I kind of a mess. Actually, I heard about that. That was the year that you went up to, uh, you went up to Whistler to be full-time filmer. Yeah. That year in Whistler. Thank God you did. Felix was the photographer as Sonic the Month. That's Man. right, Felix. Yep. Felix. Felix. So funny. Dave, do you remember which segment you edited in uh, Happy Days? I don't really remember Happy Days so much. I mean, Happy Days is honestly kind of a blur for me. The one that really sticks out in my mind was 1242. Yeah. You edited Pep's segment in 1242, like, in one day. I remember it, and I was like, don't touch it. That's the best <laughs> segment you've ever edited in your life. Do not even oh, that was touch you? it. Just leave it. Damn. Yeah. Oh, Dave edited the most iconic segments. Dave. Yo. That was the best Dave segment Levin, you Dave ever Levin, put Dave together. Is it the music, the flow, like, everything about that segment was like as good as it gets. That was a really I, fun movie. I mean, that was like, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't been paying close enough attention since then, but for the time and place, that was like the pinnacle of skiing. And it was really cool to be a part of that. Yeah. That was as good as it gets. That was Never a crazy you trip. That. You, see that, you see that rail right at that ledge? So that ledge, we filmed it. We had already filmed a bunch of days on the mountain. And then we went and ate at this restaurant and everything in the entire van got stolen. All of Steve Rosendahl's Rosendahl gear, all of Chris O'Connell's gear. And the only thing that didn't get st stolen was my camera bag because I had tied it into all the skis and it had all the film footage of 1242 that was iconic at the time in my bag. Man, Man but, lucky dumb thieves didn't get that. That was lucky. Yo. World would have missed. Uh, Levin, yeah. did you see the poster I had that you created? Which one? Oakley. The 1242 one, the best one ever you made. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, it's coming out of his nose. <laughs> I, got, I got so much scrapbook of all your shit. I got a whole thing. Awesome, man. You got some fun shit. Uh, Back in the day, I would say that without a doubt, 100%, some of the best segments that ever got edited by four, in Four Boys Productions was by Levin. 
I say that. This guy right here. I still. Hey, you guys know what's funny? I still call Levin to help me edit things every blue. <laughs> <laughs> I have to drive. I'm like, hey, you want to come to? You want to come to Hawaii? I got a free place for you to stay, and you can get locked up in the closet and edit for two weeks. Come on out. And he's like, hell yeah, dude. That I'm was gonna do it real. That work. was like, like twenty. That that was like twenty years ago, man. I, that feels like yesterday, but that was literally like twenty years ago. <laughs> I know. I want you to come back. <sighs> well, Greta wants to know how much twelve forty two costs to make. I want to know how much twelve forty two costs to make too. That's a great question. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. I didn't even know how to. How many books back then? How many? Yeah. <laughs> how many rolls? How many, do you, can you estimate how many rolls of sixteen millimeter you shot for twelve forty two? I bet we shot two hundred rolls. At least I shot probably like personally I probably Maybe shot. More. How many did you shoot? Probably sixty. Oh yeah, so we definitely shot more than two. And I was that. only like urban and like spring. Yeah, I was mid. Yeah. I shot a lot. That's one thing I definitely did. Is I shot a ton because I was shooting for, um, I was shooting for twelve forty two and ready fire aim at the same time. Oh, yeah. So I was shooting. I mean, I shot a ton. I, I never shot so much footage in my life that year. That was that was a good year though. That was super fun. And I remember. Carl Jacobson and I were working on on uh, Ready Fire Aim, and Levin was in the other room working on 1242, and I would just bounce back and forth. Levin, how's that looking? No, fix that. Do that. No, 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 no. You can't do that. Okay, that's amazing. That that sucks. Fix that. Do that. <laughs> he was, but mostly, Levin just made stuff way better. And if it wasn't <laughs> good, he would just fix it with a white pop. Your white <laughs> pops everywhere. <laughs> Fade the blacks and white pops. That was basically my my repertoire. <laughs> <laughs> it was hot. It was hot. Um, back so, so did Oakley <laughs> fund the whole movie, Johnny? Oakley did. Oakley funded the whole film. Uh, well, 1242. Um, Oakley funded it. And Solomon funded Ready Fire Aim. But then there was other sponsors that kind of paid for both. Kind of a deal. So, so I guess, like, let's for a fun one. My thought: so, Strokes Greta is the only person that knows the budget, probably. But yeah, uh, Strokes. My um, question yeah. is: how do you, as a filmmaker, uh, it might be on an interview, but how did you pick you and over uh, in the movie? Politics. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, but like, that's my was... only question. If there was no other sponsors, you know, is that a Red Bull thing calling the end? Or is that because of relationships or how does that happen? I think it was uh how, how did that happen again? We remember Levin. No, it, was, it was it was just it was straight. just that, that Pep, Pep was remember, Levin. Pep Pep was new. Yeah. God bless his heart. And Yoon was the rock star, the Ender Ender. Yeah. It was politics. And in the end it worked out perfect because that song was a perfect ender. But it was, was it straight in? Was the uh, filmmaker credits. asking, like, did you lay the movie out with you as a closing segment? No, I think it was communicated to us that that was that was going to be the thing, and so yeah, Yoon was the closing okay. segment from the beginning. Yeah, well, we're good. Yeah, so yeah. you kids know that how movies work. <laughs> yeah. Who was the opening yeah. segment? It was Tanner. Was the opener right? Yep. Yeah. Which was amazing. It was like Tanner open, Yoon closed. With the way not to make a movie boring is you put one of the better segments before the end of the movie to keep everyone's interest super high and make the movie iconic and great. You don't just bookend it with only okay through the middle. That's one thing about 1242. It was just like good all the way through. And you took a breath after Pep. After pep and you and only pep. talked about because it's the Pep segment. Yeah. It was, if it wasn't the pep segment, it all makes sense. Because everyone in that movie is dope. Everyone. You everyone know, in the movie was super but, good. But, but Pep. Pep was, was just next dope. level. Well, pep, pep, pep made people quit that year. Yeah, he did. He changed <laughs> skiing that year. He, he literally changed skiing. I, I, remember, I remember seeing for the first time his like 180 off the cliff. And then his like fives. 
Yeah. And I was just like, yeah, the one that's playing that right one, now, okay. that that 180. Yeah. It was just like, okay. Yeah. When I got that footage yeah. back, I was like, that just changed the scheme right there. <laughs> and I knew it. And then we went to uh, Sonora Pass and we did those fives. Those and fives then, are fucked. They yeah. are so big. Like the 180 was so big, it could have shut down the whole year. But ben then Mullen the fives, it was just like, I'll go faster. I'll go further. Thought the 180 was boring. I'll add a 360. Like it's just fun. I'll go left and right. Yeah, he went both directions. That was super cool. See that right there? That's like he's spinning left there, huh? Yeah. Boom. Um, Watch he that, lands. That was huge, dude. And then oh, I'll just go the other way. Oh, you did why more. why this circle is so sick to me is because I think Levin put Pujas on the map in ski movies. Because we're scandalous, that was the first segment. Scandalous. Was, it, like, pick up was, he, was he in Scandalous? I didn't think he was in yeah. Scandalous. I thought he was only in Blunt. I don't even remember. Whenever one he has bleached oh, up blunt. hair and tongue rings. Yeah. See, Levin told me, he had asked me, he's like, hey, do you mind if I shoot? Oh, he was in Scandalous. That was at Oakley shoot. I got, I got in trouble yeah. for that. Vocal yeah. ski. But it was cool because... You told me that pep was going to be something spectacular. <laughs> well, he freaking smashed that rail. The gap to rail was like, he yeah, just he rocked up to that. Yeah, because Scandalous like, was 01, and that was vocal skis. And then Happy Days was 02, and then yeah. that was his first K2 year. Yeah. Yeah, pep, pep blew it up right then. He changed everything, man. He changed everything. I forgot you know, about I forgot about that Oakley shoot with Pep that first yeah. year with that gap to rail. You know, that was major. Else did? Yeah, that the was major truck rail. Yeah. You know who else uh, did a, a big change for? Um, he, he changed things too. Was uh, Philip Poirier, Philou. In thirteen, he came on like out of nowhere. Everyone's like, "Who's this guy?" And he was like, "Massive." He did the first like. Legitimate. He was like a switchback guy, you know. He did huge ones. So we had him on the show too. How did he come into the circle as not a new Canadian Air Force guy and all this stuff? Like, how does all of a sudden he show up with four boys and dominate like he did? I was hard to remember, but do you remember Levin? I mean, I, I know that someone introduced me. That was before said, Levin's time. It was before yeah. me. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's true, huh? I think it was like he got introduced to me. And then I saw him at a contest, and I filmed him at the contest. And I was like, dude, you're insane. And he was friends with Kusan. So U.S. Open Vinny. backflip when he lost his gear was the first time you met him. Yeah. Okay. So that was right when I, the day I met you, too. Yeah. And he Same did. Time. Yeah. And then from there, I, I, he was so funny and so easy to be around. And then uh, we started filming with him, and he got on Solomon. And then it just went through the roof. Yeah. The other story that's kind of reminds me of that is the year that I was in Whistler when we were filming 1242, Mark Abma was just like kind of like hanging out and there was like Tony had to go somewhere and Abma just borrowed Tony's sled kind of I think without asking. <laughs> and so we just went out and filmed, we got a bunch of rad shots and then like that was, I feel like that was kind of like Abma's breakout year when we that did was. It was it was twelve forty two and ready fire aim was the other one right like the yeah. everybody yeah. that was in Oakley and I feel like Abma's segment in that movie was like it, in springtime when we were driving back from Whistler we had like a Sonora session and Abma hit like some jumps that were just like okay that was like massive that was his year yeah that and that was yeah, kind of like when he came out swing I want to say that's 04, is isn't it. It was the same. There. No, it was the same years. It was this, the year we were filming for twelve forty two. It was we the did first a lot year. Of Sonora that year. It was like the first year of Armada, and it was the first year. It was the year we were filming for twelve forty two. Dude, think about this. Abma has been dominated for twenty fucking years. Yeah, crazy. crazy. Twenty. We got to get him on this show too. You should. He's got some good stories. Dude, how about Dane Tudor talking about Giant De Cesare and Dane Tudor and seeing him? Talk? Have you seen what he did in the last two weeks? I did. You know what's funny is that um, I saw that he won, and I congrat. I called him and I, I started texting with him. 
And uh, we started talking all the time. And he's like, bro, you know the last time I won skier of the year? I was like, when? He goes, I won it and every day is a Saturday. Yeah. He's like, no way. He goes, I've been trying to get back on top since then. I was like, what year was every day was Saturday? 2010? Nine? 2008. Damn. Nine. Fucking day 2009. Nine. Yeah, you're right. How crazy is that? Yeah. Fucking nuts, man. Because when I think of Dane, I think of Four Boys. You know, like Pacific Northwest crew. I think he was in those movies too. No? PMW? Who? Uh, Dane? Yeah, he was originally in PMW. Like back in the day, that's where we found him. Jeff was working the Theory on three. Us. Theory three was the crew. Right? Theory three, yeah. Theory three. Yeah. I'm so psyched on the stuff, that, the work that Jeff's doing. Speaking of Theory 3, like every time I see something that Jeff makes, it just looks beautiful now. We talking Jeff Thomas? Crazy Carl. Yeah. Jeff what Thomas. does Jeff Thomas do? Crazy Carl's on here. Yeah, hey, Crazy, Crazy Carl. Carl. If we could call yeah, him five Jeff Thomas has been killing it, dude. He, he edited um, Every Day is a Saturday alongside Cody and, uh, and Tyler. He's a he's a phenomenal editor. Who's that, Dane? No, uh, that was Jeff Dane. Thomas. Yeah, Dane oh, Juan. Yeah. yeah, Jeff Thomas talking about editing, and uh, but Dane, man, that that year he was actually slotted to be in a different spot, and my buddy came over from the windsurf world. His name's Levi Cyber, and we go, "What do you think of the movie?" He goes, "Well." First thing I, I would do is I would put that guy, that Dane kid, right up front because he's the best segment in the film. I was like, whoa, damn, dude. <laughs> I go, he doesn't even ski. He was a snowboarder, but he was also a surfer, like big time windsurfer. He said, yeah, you should move that kid right up to the front. I was like, like what? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So he came out of the gates with this guy and he blew minds and he won. And yes, where was it originally? Second. So, did I ever hear a story of confrontation of his changing of location of his segments in one of your films? No, he just wanted to have a closer. We gave him a second to closer, and that was again, that was like a. But instead, you gave him opener? Yeah, we gave him opener. Instead. Okay, okay, okay. Is that never did? Did a story. I can't remember. It was for. Uh, I forgot what it was, but it was for like Revolver, I think. Yeah, this would be a good Cody Carter call in. Code Daddy. Yeah, yeah. Cody, 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 Cody would know for sure. Guys, I'm going to bounce. I'm going to open up the floor for someone else to, for someone else right, to come dude. in here and say stupid stuff instead of me. Awesome. It's really, really fun to see y'all. I'm going to keep watching, though. Hell yeah. Yeah, hey, I love that. You're in charge. Hey, let's make another ski movie sometime, Johnny. That'd be sweet. Yeah, let's do it. You got any clips I can edit? I'll shoot. You edit. Put it. Put them on Dropbox and send them over, and I'll I'll put them together. All right, let's go. All right, cool, man. Only yeah. Eric, only yeah. Eric films. How fun was that, Johnny? Like you yeah. just got. I forget. When was the last time you hung out with Ivory and Lemon at the same time? Oh, not a long time. That was good stuff. I loved it. This man, couldn't be any more fun. Who else was there, Phil? There's some fun people that keep popping up that I. Kurt Heine is even fucking here. Wait, oh, Kurt Heine's on right now? Big up yourself, Kurt. Kurt, <laughs> where are you? Are we you just we just give a love to Johnny. Tell him how rad he is for the last hour and a half. Dude, if it wasn't for Kurt, I wouldn't be poor boys either. Kurt was like the man of the man. He's the one who built the loop. He built the quarter pipe transfer. He built the big hip. All that cool stuff. Quarter Heine, you're pipe the best. tricks with all the cameras. Oh, oh no. yeah, that was so we cool. got the that down was the that was the intro radio, shot of intro shot of propaganda with Tucson. <laughs> and then so, on the yeah, so we have the loop. We have the the circle down rail with Tanner. Yeah. We got a wavy rail with Steel and Kusan. Man, yeah. Great Heine. You're Heine pretty much legends. horrible, man. Yeah, like spider rail. Secret, secret guy. He was a secret guy. And then he filmed one solid year for us, and 
roller coaster rail. See, we were just watching that. That's with what Kusan. I said with Kusan and Steel. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, man. He, he killed it. The year that we did, he did a full year with us. We won that year, too. Fire rail with Tanner. Yeah, you can keep going, Kurt. We know them all. Matrix, quarter pipe. What else do you got? Oh, you know what? Quarter pipe tips. transfer with rail with mm -hmm. uh, with Anthony and Pollard. And then the rail taken out, quarter pipe transfer to transfer to backside. Yeah. Pollard did that transfer off the back. He used it for um, he used it for straight jacket films and uh, on his cover and we used the loop. There it is. There's the transfer. Boom. That was so sick. It was. We got three angles of that shot, Phil. I edited that. Oh, I remember the rail to drop. Set up the rail on the edge. There, there we it go. is. Boom. Oh. Pollard. We got Pollard. Oh, his style is just so good. Man. Pollard had mad seeds as well. He was like, he had his own thing going on. He was the first guy to really do the whole no pole thing. And he took it to the next level. Yeah. Show the next shot after this, Bill. Just because the people deserve it. Watch this. Boom. And one more from the other angle. Because same one. That one. Best of all time. Yeah, that was such a sick one. Granny Finder. Was that your shot or my shot? We had that... cameras side by side by side that day. We I was right beside you, about 10 feet downhill. Yeah. You had, you had Cody. We had two TGR, two MSPs. I never I... seen them. Our films. I never seen the other shots. That was the best one right there. A, you and yours looked exactly like mine. You my shot color, me. my coloring's a little different. Yeah, but you shot. You shot just as good as me. Phil, I'm going to hand it to you for approximately a minute because I have to pee when I drink a forty. So now, <laughs> with no voice, you must talk to Johnny, and I'll be back. <laughs> Here we go. Hit us, uh, so I'm gonna keep it short. Hit us with some rapid fire. Favorite ski segment. Favorite ski segment. Propaganda. Probably propaganda. Kusan. Or Dane. Every day's a Saturday. Favorite athlete you ever worked with jp eau claire the worst athlete you ever worked with oh that's <laughs> so tough <laughs> oh there's gotta be one though there has to be an asshole it had to have been rex Werman. no i made that name up because i was trying to think of a name on the poster Bye, so, Rex, I don't know you, and that wasn't anything mean because I always like watching back to the fighting process. Uh, shoot. I, I, I don't know. There was someone who was always pissy. Who was it? I don't know. If you say who's the worst to film with, how about that? Hi, Berg. You got someone? Oh, you I asked got. me? Who's the worst that you ever had to film with? Like, okay, I'm filming this guy. Oh, it's going to suck. Even though it wasn't like he was a bad person, maybe. I'm secretly giving you in my answer. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. She was difficult. Yeah. She was very difficult. I think my answer would be... I Jaya didn't say Kusan. anything. Don. Who are you talking about? I think J.F. <laughs> Tucson was... Or Vinny. They were the toughest guys to film with back in the day. I mean, yeah, Kusan dude. was a Kusan was a very big blanky guy. Yeah, he definitely. Film. You'd just be like, okay, it's Marvel filming. We got everything set up. We got everything ready. Got the shot. You'd just be a no show. And no if he showed him. up, if he got the shot, he was like, but you know, I got the shot. Like, yeah, I'm done. He, he was like, why aren't you content with me? Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Fuck, yeah. I wanted to ask some. What else you got for rapid fire, Phil? I thought of that random today, but I, I forgot. Yeah, that was very fast. Best filming style. Who got it? Best filming style. Yeah, you got lots of filmers. No, uh, I probably, like, probably Tyler was the best. Big up Tyler Hamlet. 
Yeah, probably Tyler. Right, Tyler. I mean, Eric, you and I filmed very similar. We were make sure we got the shot, guys. And you were good. You were probably more stylish than me. But, Johnny, we're pro we're producers. Yeah, we know how to do everything and then bring it all together. So this yeah. is where, like, I credit you. Like, there's people like everyone can do something, but not everyone can bring everyone together. So I was. Like, I look at you and me as the same. Like, be like, okay, you want to make something happen? I love you guys. Let's yeah. make what your dream is. Oh, we. I'll make a phone call. You just be cool. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, that's how we make our friends, like, I mean, even with Phil, that's what I do. It's like, all right, we know what our friends want, but they want to focus on their skill set, not the phone calls. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I think I think Tyler is one of the better guys. There's a few. Tyler's definitely good. Uh, keep going. What you got? Favorite camera lens. Favorite camera lens was a 10 to 110. Zeiss on my film camera. That was the one. I got a question. Can I get nerdy quick? Go back to Rapid later. One, so you got into 16 millimeter kind of because you had to, because that's what people were giving you budget to do, and that's what you represented. But when you got into high definition, then cameras changed every fucking year? Yeah. Were you, like, as a filmmaker, because I look at you as a hardcore filmmaker in all different sports, like, is that fun anymore? When your camera changes every year and the size, I, like it had to be so crazy to go seven straight years of like here's my size, my width, my things, and like all of a sudden everything's outdated every year, nothing's compatible, and you got to charge. Like, yeah, because you at the highest level of benefit change every year. You always have the new dragon, the new red, the new whatever the fuck is next year. <laughs> <laughs> They've gotten so big now, it doesn't even matter. Like, now you can like downsize, it's like good. It's like, now I just shoot with the same red. I got an 8K helium and I've had it for like four years and it works amazing. Oh yeah? So hey, Kurt, Kurt Heine, Candy. Hey, check this out. Candy Tovex gets my vote for best ski I ever filmed. Kurt Heine. Oh, Kurt was probably one of the best guys too. Kurt, you're the best. Kurt is fucking dope. The hardest working cameraman I've ever met in my whole entire life is Kurt Heine. So as Tanner, if Kurt, you're still here, Tanner Hall is the hardest working human I've ever met in my life in the sport of skiing. You're the hardest working human I've ever met in the sport of life. Big up yourself. <laughs> Big up, Heine. He's a man. Heine was a good surfer, too. He turned into a surf crazy man. Then he got hit by a car. Now he doesn't surf as much. He wants wow. to talk about the tree jib. What was the tree jib? I know you guys did... Uh, Dude, tree jib was sick. Trip, tree jib was sick. It was in Lake Tahoe. We did it at that other resort. Oh, with Candide. Yeah, with Candide. Oh, and that kid went so freaking high, he was freaking us out. I mean, it wasn't just big. It was, like, enormous. Scary yeah, stuff. That was powder two-page spread. That was vertical of that shot or whatever, I remember. Yeah, he hit the tree. He, there was a branch. He couldn't cut it down. It was too high. And he ended up going all the way to the top just nuts. Death metal openers, Levin says. And all what the fuck you're, you're on crack rock, fucking lacked Nick's monster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, else else we got, got to go? Movies, Armada, fucking foundation, epicness. Now we just got to do stories, man. There's got to be so many fun ones, too. Like, because that, like, what I think of, like, even Q pipe store, you produced the Q pipe, or, or was that Riley? The Q pipe, yeah. Uh, that wasn't Riley, it was like it was Simon's idea. Simon had this crazy idea, but did you produce the, the shoot, or was that for his Red, Red Bull produced the shoot? We shot it, and we we use it in our film, and then he did the uh, he did the quarter pipe, like the, the biggest quarter pipe hit, and you you shot that too, yeah. So let's talk about those because to me that was the craziest. Like Heine was nuts, but this was Red Bull. You know, like this next level of like creating a feature, not with a, a bunch of friends with the poles. Yeah. But, uh, what that was that half pipe thing like? Even being part of it because like I bugged out. Tanner and I dreamed about this shit for years, and then when we saw it, it was like holy fuck, man! Like 
don't know. What's your side from a film maker looking at that thing? It was like, nuts. You know, uh, Mike McIntyre, he shot the long lens from the bottom. Um, they had Red Bull brought in a Cineplex. You can see that shot right there. Cineplex. We shot the sides and the top. And Simon was a nut. He's, it was legitimately like when you were there, it may not look crazy, as crazy when you see it right here. But dude, if you were there, it was mind blowing. Like that. It's fucked up. It's fucked it's, up. It's so nuts. And you can imagine in person how much more nuts it is. So we thought that was one of the, that was one of the craziest shoots ever. And we had to get lucky, you know? And the year before that, was it the year before? After when Bobby did the triple, it was in the exact same spot. It was right around there. So, oh yeah, the same location. After yeah, that. so we filmed. I think that was like the first triple. Yeah. No, you're telling me, Bob. No, I thought Simon did the first triple. I can't remember, but it was one. Sammy. Sammy. Sammy did it, and it was in Mount Hood. Yeah. Oh, summer 2010. Yeah, look at that. Because this oh, was 2000. That was nuts. Yeah, I couldn't believe he did it. He got okay. So the story about this 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 cutout pipe, he crashed a bunch and never made it to the bottom. And he's like, "I'm done." They were like, "What do you mean you're done?" He's like, "I'm done." I'm, what? Because they want to come, come back, back I'll run. Well, that was the goal, right? That was yeah. the whole purpose of it. You know, it would have been a failure if he didn't make it. And uh, he's like, "I'll come back tomorrow. I can't do this. I'm I'm broken." And we we're like, holy schmoly, because his heels were all jacked, and like, yeah, I mean, he had crap like ten times, and uh, it wasn't even supposed to be that nice the next day. So we were all thinking it's over, and freaking Simon got back up, put his stuff on. We all set up and freaking did it in one try. No way. Yeah, he went up there. No like warm up one hitters to get warmed up, just like drop in and do the whole freaking thing like you he's going cork nine up top spill still there yes nice i heard he was going cork nine and top just what that guy in frozen motion was saying holy smokes is b-dog a beginner Yo, John, yeah, man, I just started. Yo, John, I'm surprised with that. Man, you think he's, oh, we're going to call him back? Yeah, give him a call. I got 20%. That sounds about right. You know, we're in about 10 more minutes, two hours. I think Johnny's phone died. I think so, too. Johnny. So while you're uh, playing with that and looking and touching buttons, what was the first Poor Boys movie you ever saw, Phil? The motherfucking game. The game? So you were what? You were 10 years old? Game is 2000. I was 11. Wow. Changed my fucking life right there. And did you have twin tips when you saw this movie? Not yet. Nope. I got him after. My parents got him for me. Did you, have, did you have a trick that you saw in the movie The Game that you had to go and try? Switch right 360 mute grab from Toluca. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it took me a while. And when I did it, and then my homie V Money got the Switch 5 of Kusan, we thought we were pros. Switch right, yeah. So Switch Three was ill back then. Only fucking Falu did the Switch Three mute, mm. and then it was right side spinning. Yeah, he spun it right. And then did he do it with a lead mute? No, he did it with the the same mute. I don't know what. Uh, yeah, lead mute. Yep. Johnny's back. Call him back in. Must have plugged in that motherfucking phone. Johnny. Ching Chang Johnny. Man, what other fun questions can we ask for Johnny? I know what the next question is. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, 
first. We know what's important. Why why did you quit making ski movies? Why did I what? Quit making ski movies. Why did I quit making ski movies? You know why? Cuz mm, I don't think it was as fun for me. I needed a break after 20 years of making ski films. I needed to just like take like step away a little bit, take a break. And so to be a little bit more clear, like say after 2005, I'd say like I saw you like bring in another crew of young kids to kind of start like taking over certain duties. And I think like you started, when was your, when was your first windsurfing film? 2008, nine? Yeah, basically right around there. So, I mean, like I did see a transition from you, you know, because there was poor boys that last skiing where you kind of like took off a little earlier. But for you, for like you, so you kept the like idea alive of poor boys with people that were passed with big up Cody and Tyler. Cause I mean, I'd say what from 2007 to eight, they were the reason skiing existed in poor boys. Yeah. Basically Cody and Tyler took over most of the duties and started doing everything. I mean, I always, I was always part of it, but like the last couple of years, they went way deeper than me and I was more in the surf world. But I mean, let's like, dude, you made a windsurfing movie and like it won a big award, right? Like when you kind of left yeah. the ski world. So I mean, it, and then like not only that, but like it introduced you to like kind of the Sean White, Tony Hawk of the water world as a 12 year old. Yeah. Yeah. I so I, I, it, to me, it always made sense because like how fun is that when you start something fresh and new and the windsurf, like and we're talking about Kai Lenny, right? That's how you say yeah. his name. Yeah, so, and that's what is fun because I would have never known who he is if it wasn't for you, and I still wouldn't because I don't follow that world. But I follow him because of you, since he was a little kid, and it's just like fuck, man. Like to be the illest water, I don't even I didn't even know what a water man was before him. Like I called <laughs> Kai Peterson a snowman because of Kai Lenny. I'm like Kai Lenny's a water man. You a snowman? You climb it, you ski it, you play in it. So it's just kind of fun, man. Like so it's fun to see your transition too. But when you got into that shit, was it the same vibes as when you got into skiing? Was there something new that you uh, felt other than youth that you worked with? Or was, was there something that was happening that, that was, was it. in the you water? Know you know what? Working with Kai brought me back to like when I was working with Shane Zox and JP and those kind of guys back in the early days. That's pretty much where, where it was going, you know? Like there he is, the little tiny kid. And then he became this, he's like a huge, he's massive in the sport of surfing world now. And uh, basically that's what it was. It was like it brought me back that feeling, you know. I was back to the roots again. And it was core, it was uh, it was growing, it was new. So, so how do you do this? How, how do you end up when you're at the top of the game, poor boys, in skiing? How did you even end up like, I know your roots are or water and SoCal, but how the, I guess I'd never understood how you ended up. Like, how do you leave and go make a windsurfing movie from a ski movie? It was weird, man. I just went to uh, Maui because of a girl. I was chasing some, some girl around and, and uh, before I got married, you know, and she introduced me to all these like windsurfer guys and I hated the wind. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, the wind is like evil. I just want to go surfing and the wind ruins it and all these weird guys on these big sails come out. But then I started watching it and I was like, damn, this is sick. They were doing crazy. Did you stuff. watch dumb movies growing up? Yeah. So you watched the wind because to me the windsurfing segments in two of his movies were epic. When the windsurfer went over the helicopter and yeah. one of his movies is one of the most imprinted memories of my life. <laughs> It's funny, man. Yeah, I, I started, dude. I started loving windsurfing, and I, 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 uh, I met this guy, Jace Bonavienko, and we made, we made the windsurfing film. It became the most iconic windsurf film ever made. Not boasting, I'm just saying it just became this crazy. It just became a crazy film, right? It just became the film in windsurfing, and I didn't mean it to. It just, it was just fun for me, and and then all of a sudden I got wrapped into the. That world and that turned into surfing world. Does windsurfing movies make money? Nah. Make okay, money. so same culture. 
same culture. It was smaller. Okay. Smaller. That's what I would assume. But I'm just saying when you make something iconic, which you already did a decade previous, and then you do another thing. So it's interesting. And that's what a fun thing that's reoccurring here is like that it, after 20 of these shows, it's like all the people that we deal with like created their own lane. And when you create your own lane, you don't like get riches. You just not, fucking create dope shit that no one else creates in the world. We just, I did, I did it for the love, man. I, I mean, I never got rich. Poor boys, that's for damn sure. And, uh, but I, I'm rich with life, you know, memories, friends, everything that I have is because of Ski World. You know, if you sold that camera and lens, you probably could buy yourself a <laughs> 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 There you go. Look at Dad's got the windsurfing shirt on there. I got the surf ranch. Yeah, your dad's the best Santa Claus. Yeah, he was so good. He was <laughs> so good at Santa Claus. Oh, Santa Claus. Yeah, he was super good. He was super good. My dad's got funny stories. He's Pablo Escobar. Freaking. Craziness. Yeah, I can That's understand. Cold. Yeah. But, like, you know, you don't need to get rich to uh, to enjoy life. I think life is about, you know, what you make it and, and how much you can enjoy it is, like, whether you win or not. It's not how much you get in the end. But if you're winning at life, it's because you're enjoying it, you know? And I, I enjoy it. Every, I've enjoyed every second of my life. I enjoyed every second of making ski films. I still love skiing to death, man. I still love it to death. I was so excited to watch Sammy's new segment today. I think he's one of the best skiers of all time. I think he's he's uh, like a backcountry master, yet he can do urban. You know, he's good at pretty much everything. I think, uh, yeah, I still watch Tanner. Like, any anytime he puts something out, I, I know he got hurt last year at the end, yeah? When did he get hurt? Two years ago. How long has he been since he's been going hard? I don't know. 20 years? 22 years? No, he's been going forever, dude. But he took a break, yeah, a little bit. No, I mean, he had like, I mean, he sobered up like six years ago was a big thing. But to me, like, he's always gone hard. Like, if he really went every year, the only year he never went hard was 2010 when we made Lake Goliath. Yeah. 2011. (laughs) He came back and had closing segment of Vitalik jumping out of helicopter skiing lines after two broken legs and two blown knees. He only had one year in his whole career he didn't go hard. And it was because he was fucking cracked out, on drugs, alcoholic, recovering from two legs and knees. And then, then he went five years with still fucking his problems. And then he sobered up and is like, ah. And even right now he's at Woodward dominating every day. And then you got Candide drop segments like last week where you're like, oh my God, is that 16 year old kid doing a dub in a 30 foot kicker in the park? Those guys are still going crazy, dude. I love it. Those guys are are still winning. They're winning in life. Like I said, it ain't about how much money you make, but how much you enjoy life. I think that's the most important thing is just enjoy every minute of your life, treat people with respect, you know, be kind, be humble. And uh, good things with Columbia. I've enjoyed every second of my life so far. Hope it keeps going. I keep watching everyone else. Too. Like the other thing, other than like say Armada, the movies, the platforms, helping create the industry, all that shit. I say that the number one thing about Johnny is everyone says a nice person. Number one thing. You know, like no matter who you are and what, whether it's surfing, whether it's skiing, whatever, you know, like that's where you need to get your respect too. Because that's why you got, like, you're just a good person. Ah, thanks. Man. That's a big fucking thing, man. There's not a lot of great, good people on this world, man. And, like, for you to be a good person as long as you've been in this world, it's pretty amazing, man. So thank you for always doing that because everyone can always say you had a smile. Always, Everyone can always mm-hmm. say you had the best intentions for them. Right? You've never yeah. had bad intentions for anyone. So, like, these two, I don't know. That's amazing because, like, that's all I can say. Someone says, oh, what's Johnny's like? Oh, he's just a nice guy. Probably a nice guy you'll ever meet. You know? <laughs> oh. Well, that was, uh, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. I think that was just instilled from my parents and how I was brought up. But I just, uh, I love life, man. I'm a person who loves life and enjoys, enjoys watching people have fun, documenting people.
we'll have fun documenting these cool stuff. And uh, and I love sport too. I love I I do sport every day if I can. Yeah, give give thanks for good parents because I know your mom wrote all my checks. So I can <laughs> work for you. And to think of that too, like I don't know, it's a big deal. Like I know my my dad and stuff like that. Like he's helped out. And I saw your mom like in your business, like the signature person, and that's who I call in business when you're on the road filming and being yeah. a producer. So yeah, once again, as we highlight in the show, parents are the shit. And right. like, thanks for great parents, because there's a reason why a lot of people create awesome shit. Happens to oh, yeah. parents. It's true. It's true, true. Thanks for your uh, wisdom and uh, time shared with us, Johnny. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, we so, did have a solid two hours. Phil, do we have anything left? I can't believe it. Uh, no, unless you can think of something. I don't have anything but other to uh, uh, say uh, I wish I had a, a voice to uh, give you an intro, but I'll be uh, writing it down. So it was a joy to have you on. And like Iberg said, you're one of the nicest persons around. And any time I've got to uh, be around you, it's a very uplifting vibe. And thank you for setting me on the path that I'm on because you're responsible for making this first movie I've ever seen and that got me into skiing. Uh, thanks, bro. I appreciate it. Um, you guys are amazing. Keep doing what you do. And uh, I bring you're a legend. Let's face it. You're an absolute legend. If, Hang it uh, out. You weren't in my life. Six was up, Chris, Dave. Eh? <laughs> hey, if you weren't in my life, I don't think four boys would be four boys. So, you know, you got to give yourself some uh, some credit. Big up is teamwork make the dream work, Johnny. Teamwork make the dream work. There you go. So, and you guys yeah, are a good I'll team now. So. Opportunities as well. Because, yeah, like, man. if I would have just had all my footage in my camera and not make a movie, even though I gave them to you, gave it to you, like, I don't know, man. There's a reason why everything works. Like, I'm, you can't do it. Every day I try to do everything myself, still to this day. But once said and done, the number one thing I look for is a team. And there so, you like, you know, you can't do it, man. No matter how much you want to, it's like you can learn it, but you know there's someone better than you at it. So thank you for, like, giving me all the opportunities I had, whether that was giving you footage, editing movies, whether putting out movies under the poor boy's label, and always being stoked on whatever I did and fucking high-fiving me. It was awesome. <laughs> Give thanks. Yeah, thanks, Eric. You rock. Hell yeah, you do too, Johnny. Well, fucking have a great night. And uh, let's talk again sooner than later in life. Sounds good. Awesome, Yeah, Johnny. boys. Peace, Johnny. Later have a great night. Take care, Eric. Peace. Later. Oh. Well, Phil... As the communicator tonight, you know, I'm sorry. We only lived this show on tonight and didn't delay because John never is home. And if we delayed, we might not get him again. So give thanks to Johnny. That's the only reason I did it. Give thanks to Phil for doing the show. Because we had to tell people about how dope Johnny was. And then next week is special. Next week is super special to me. Next week, we got Roy on the show. Roy motherfucking Silva. 20 years ago to the day, I did uh, my birthday with Rory, which happens to be next Wednesday. So we live in the dream. We do another birthday party with him 20 years later. And then we're going to tell you guys how dope this human being is. Because if you don't know about Rory, type his name in R-O-R-Y S-I-L-B-A Illist. We're doing it mm. next week. One love, Phil. Peace, brothers. <laughs> Have a wonderful Brothers and sisters on the chat. Turpin, Greg T, everybody that tuned in. We love y'all. Yeah, man. See you next week. Have a great night. You too, brother. Peace.